Okay, so welcome to me and Ailey's presentation from Holst and Ailey, where are you at? Uh, home. Home, there you go. <laughs> so our paper is called Metabolic Pathway Analysis, Identify Proline Biosynthesis Pathway as a Promoter of Liver Tumor Genesis. So it's kind of a mouthful, but we'll walk through it. It will be good. There you go. All right, so starting with kind of the outline for what we'll be talking about today. First, we're going to go over what we look into, FLHCC versus HCC, which is the main cancer in this paper, and how we can compare them. Then we're going to be going through major players, which Hannah will be discussing kind of keywords that you're going to be noticing a lot throughout. Materials and methods, very brief because a lot of it's explained throughout the figures and we'll go more into it then. Then we're going to dive into the article figures, which is probably the main bulk of this paper. There's a final summary that we have for you, some future experiments that we'll use for our sake and our own experiments. And then we have questions for you at the end. So the first thing we want to talk about is this article deals with HCC. So we've been studying what's called FLHCC, which is a subcategory of liver cancer. So HCC stands for heptocellular carcinoma. So just a little like scope perspective, liver cancer diagnosis is increased by 75% worldwide within the past like 15 years. In the US, um, the number of diagnoses have tripled since 1980. Um, and the American Cancer Society estimates that there are 42,810 new cases of liver cancer and intrahepatic bile duct cancer. So liver and bile duct cancers usually go together. Um, which form in the bile duct branches in the liver will be diagnosed in 2020. So HCC is called um, heptoma also is the most common type of liver cancer. So there's usually a lot more research on it than FLHCC. Um, and it accounts for 75% of all liver cancer. Um, HCC starts in the main type of liver cells called heptocellular cells and usually are from an infection or alcoholism. Okay, so why can we compare these to FLHCC and versus you know, HCC? So some similarities, obviously they both originated in the liver and something that's common with the liver, what we've noticed from reading a couple different papers is that the liver seems to favor the proline pathway. So there's a benefit to see kind of how it works within different outcomes as well, but because it works within the liver, you can see lots of different functions within it. Sorry, ignore my dog. And then there's also limited treatment options within both of them, which is something that I didn't realize, I think a lot of us didn't realize for HCC that it wasn't super treatable. Um, differences though that we do want to note is that FLHCC is much more rare than HCC is, where HCC is one of the, the fifth most common cancer. Also within the proline pathway, we think that proline is being converted into collagen within FLHCC and within reading this paper, HCC is using proline as a tool to make more NADP or NAD plus. So the first thing we want to do before we dive in, I'm just going to move us to the middle so you can see my pictures, um, is really look at who the major players are. So we're going to go over the major players first, just so you can understand all the figures. So first are the in vivo models, which just means that it takes place in a living organism. So our first is this Morris hepto heptoma, which is a cancerous cell line derived from a rat that has HCC. So it's basically a rat that has heptocellular carcinoma. And then there's also the dead mouse and rat. I'm not going to try and say that, but they are mouse and rats that they induced in their lab to have HCC and then grew their cell lines out. And then we also have in vitro models. So an in vitro means it's still living, but it means it's outside of its normal biological context. Therefore, these are cell lines grown outside of a person in a lab. Cell lines, by definition, are cancerous as they are a cell culture developed from a single cell and usually have a uniform genetic makeup. So in our lab, we use HEC-293. Katrina and I have been dabbling around with that. And these cell lines, that they use were HEP3B, which is a human liver sample that has HCC, and then HUH7. Found a weird amount of information about HUH7, 
psoriasis from a 57 year old male who was Japanese who had HCC fun fact. So this is what they look like. These are three different versions of the health line. As you can see, they're just cells grown in a fast flask. And then the last one is the human tumor samples. So these samples in this article have already been fixed and processed, which means they're a little different from like what we use in our lab. We have fresh samples, meaning that we can run Western blots, we can kind of manipulate these samples more, which is very rare in the science world. So the samples they use have been processed, meaning they can only do what's called an immunohistological micrograph, which is down here, where they chop up the uh, tissue into super, super small stain and stain it and see what happens. Um, so that's why in the article they focus mostly on in vivo and in vitro models, so the end, because these are more readily available um, before they dive in to the human samples. Okay, let's see. Perfect. All right, it's loading. Um, so a quick materials and methods overview. First, they used lentivirus-mediated shRNA knockdown and overexpression. So how they did this is they used shRNA, which is short hairpin RNA, which is an artificial RNA molecule that has a tight hairpin term, you know, hence the name, and it's used to silence the specific gene's expression through RNA interference. So within the paper, shRNA was used to target rat and human PCRs to generate knockdown constructs. Also then to overexpress them later. We'll discuss that in the figures. They also used animal studies and animal models like Hannah was saying earlier. They have the Morris heptoma and the den samples in both mouse and rat. There is a couple different ways they did that. They did that subcutaneously and orthotopically within the rat and mice. Uh, they did PCR analysis, quantitative reverse transcription PCR, QT PCR, which you'll see probably um, was often used to confirm either change in the expression and then also extract the RNA from the DEN and Morris hepatoma models, regenerating liver tissue and non-tumor liver tissues. Then uh, transcriptomic and meta metabolomic analyses. I don't know if I said that right. Um, the animal liver tissues for the transcriptomic analyses were collected and then used to show how those metabolic metabolomic pathways within the liver tissues, so the DEN and Morris hepatoma models, were dysregulated. So an interesting thing to note though throughout this is that the changes that they saw through those um, metabolic pathways that were altered was that it was not seen in regenerating tissues and wasn't associated with generic proliferation but was specific to tumorogenesis. They used the glycolytic function test later in figure five, which Hannah will describe, and it basically just shows the amount of glycolysis happening within a cell. And then HCC patient studies, which is just human samples that were obtained for figure six. So Ailey and I figured the best way to kind of walk through this article is to break down each of the figures and highlight what is going on in this figure because this article has a lot of the same conclusions, but they double check it in different models. They look more specifically at things. It's a very in-depth article. So we're gonna talk through each figure pretty slowly, then recap it all at the very end to make sure you guys understand all the key takeaways and then how it can relate. So um, before we dive too much into this figure, we need to discuss kind of a little bit more about why we're looking at proline. So let me pull up my little laser pointer. So proline um, is part of metabolism. Metabolism is really important in different cancers and tumors because that is what is supporting this intense growth and proliferation of tumors. Cancer is defined as mass proliferation. That's how you get little tumors. Um, and then they specifically identified that proline biosynthesis plays a specific role in proliferation. So that's why we're kind of looking at this proline pathway. So the first part of this figure in figure A right here, I'm gonna move you guys over here. Figure A is they're looking at the most upregulated genes in HCC models. Um, from there, they start crossing kind of genes off that list. Um, they move quickly from uh, most upregulated to least upregulated, trying to figure out what to study more of. They decided against the two most upregulated up here, PHG, 
GDH and PSAT1, as they found not to be a good predictor of clinical outcomes. Um, the article then had a couple sentences about how they should still be looked into, and it was kind of like, they're not the biggest target for therapeutic intervention, so they basically decide to save them for like a rainy day experiment. And then the next two are what we are going to look a lot into for this article was PRO-DH and PYCR1. So PRO-DH, might butcher this name, just hold on, stands for proline dehydrogenase 1, well that was another, and PYCR1, which promotes synthesis of proline. So they found that PYCR1 was um, increased 15 fold in mouse tumors and 25 to 30% fold in rat tumors after having barely detectable um, amounts in normal samples. So as you can see in C right here, the normal, so all these clear bars are gonna be your normal samples. And then all the colored ones are up regulation. And it kind of, this is your gonna be your color scheme right here. So this is the mouse den, which we talked about is a line of a mouse that has HCC, rat den, and then your Morris heptoma. Um, they also found in conjunction with that, that ProDH, so PYCR1 goes this way towards proline, ProDH blocks the liver away from proline, is opposite of PYCR1, meaning that they saw a major decrease in this. So you can see that down here, we have lots of high levels in normal ones, but not in our tumors. Um, the other figure I want to draw you to on this one is figure D. So this is what's called the Western blot. You guys have probably seen lots of them by now. FLHCC kind of lives and breathes Western blots. But I really want to show you guys this one because this is something that like FLHCC could actually do. So this is a visual representation of their findings. You can see there's not really any bandings in non-tumor and then very thick kind of dark bands in your tumor. And then I just want to point out that they also, with every test they run for PYCR1 and ProDH1, they do um, gap DH, which is just kind of a housekeeping gene, which is how they can compare. So if everyone shows a gap DH, that means that it's real that they don't have a PYCR1 there. Yeah. So we also just want to show that there's lots and lots of proline. So this is kind of the first start. What are we actually seeing in the liver cells? Why does it matter? Oh, there's my little red boxes. There. Okay, so really quick, I'm going to make sure I can get a mouse to kind of point out some stuff. Okay, so hopefully you guys can see my little arrow. Um, there's a lot to break down within this figure. This one is showing the results of all the tests that they did with PYCR1. So in A here, you can see the Western blot right here. So you have your normal rat liver, you have some cell lines, and then your animal model, um, Morris hepatoma, and then there's a non-tumorigenic cell line right here. PYCR1. Mouse? Did I say something wrong? Exfoliant. So I put a little stoplight, a little spotlight on it, because I can't see oh. your. Oh, okay, perfect. Sorry. Okay. okay. So um, there. So within these different though, um, the cell lines show that there is a high expression of PYCR1, but we're not seeing a high expression of PYCR1 in the normal rat liver, or in the Morris hepatoma and non-tumorigenic cell line. In B then, we're now assessing knockdown efficiency. Knockdown is just silencing that gene through shRNA, and it just helps to show the function of PYCR1 in the liver. So the knockdown efficiency was assessed in the Western blots through three different shRNA constructs, and then it was graphed right here. So the white right here is control in all of them, and then the different colors are just the three different constructs. So you can see also the Western blots underneath just showing a representation of it as well. And these are relative PYCR1 levels. So it's not cell proliferation, but just showing how much PYCR1 was in it. So there are all lower levels than we see in the control in both the Morris hepatoma animal model um, cell 
and then uh, the cell HCC cell lines. C is similar to B, however, instead of measuring the PYCR1 levels, we're seeing a normalized cell index, which just shows the cell proliferation level. So if it's at a higher rate, there's going to be a lot of cell proliferation. The, again, the white or the clear ones are in control, and then the colored ones are our different cell lines and whatnot. So the cell index was measured, and it was found that the depletion of PYCR1 significantly decreased the amount of cell proliferation in all of the HCC cell lines. Um, quick note again, backing up, is that it did not affect the non tumorigenic cells. So, yep, just seeing here, all much lower levels than the um, control. In D and E is where we see actual tumors that were seen in mouse. The mouse is the subcutaneous one in D, and then rat was in E for the orthotopic. So that is just the different ways that the HCC cells were injected and then would cause the animals to get an HCC and then grow tumors. So in the control, which is the top on both of them, there are much larger tumors. And then with PYCR1 knockdown, there was a significant decrease in tumor size compared to that control right there, exactly. And then there are just two graphs on the side showing the amount of um, tumor growth. So the white bar would be the top part of the picture, and then the blue bars would be those smaller tumors. F and G, um, we kind of had to talk through this one a little bit because it was a little confusing at first. Hopefully, I'll make sure it makes sense. So on the bottom of all of them, we're seeing those Western blots again um, with the gap DH, which just shows that we can compare all of them and that each of them do have the PYCR1. So these are normalized cell index graphs, which means that we're looking at cell proliferation. In F, we're looking at an animal model cell line. And then in G, we're looking at two different human HCC cell lines. So the doxycycline, which is you'll see at the bottom of the graph by dox, that is something that induces the PYCR1 knockdown. But in order for it to be expressed, you need the tet on, which is right here down to the bottom, and that will then cause the knockdown to occur. So like if we're thinking about the PGLO lab, GFP is the gene that glows, but you need arabinose to promote it. So that docs kind of acts as the GFP and then that tet on is what promotes it. So the white bars again are controls and what we see is that the docs, when it's a minus, it means that it's not present and when it's a plus, it means that it is present. So the plus here just shows that that was there and then we saw a little bit higher than control in our um, tet on which it would be which would induce the knockdown when it wasn't there we didn't see much of a change from the control but then when we see the plus so the doxycycline is being expressed and knocking down pycr1 levels there is decreased cell proliferation now looking into g the we have a couple more things that we're looking at. So what we're now trying to do is show that reintroduction of PYCR1 would rescue cell proliferation. So how they did that was through a vector. So the vector, which is on the bottom there, there is what something would hold the PYCR1 gene and how they would reintroduce it into the cells. So when that is present and we see the PYCR1 expressed, that last bar, the dark blue one, shows that the reintroduction of PYCR1 does rescue cell proliferation. However, and then in the other ones, if we do see the vector, but the PYCR1 isn't expressed, so it's that second white bar, that is where we see it doesn't rescue because the PYCR1 isn't turned on. So overall, this data from all this suggests that PYCR1 is necessary for the proliferation of tumorigenic cell lines in vitro and in vivo. Okay. If you want to try controlling again, Ailey, you can. I'll try. Uh, you know, I think I can explain this one without control. Hopefully, I'll just be able to do that. Okay. So, this figure has to do with gene families. So, typically with gene families, we see that similar genes can 
rescue some functions of genes that have been knocked down. But, and so the thought with this one was that there is PYCR2 and PYCR1. And the researchers thought that if PYCR1 was knocked down, potentially PYCR2 would rescue that cell proliferation to an extent. Um, because, and the reason why they thought this is because they both have a high amino acid sequence similarity and are both localized in the mitochondria. And that is the basis of why they thought they were so similar. So when P, in PYCR1 knockdown cells, when PYCR2 was overexpressed, it failed to rescue the cell proliferation. So that suggests that PYCR1 and PYCR2 have separate functions and PYCR2 is not involved in the regulation of HCC proliferation like PYCR1 is. So you can kind of just see within the figures, these just show the different genes within PYCR1 and PYCR2 that are downregulated or upregulated. And then on the right is further showing genes that are being expressed throughout the separate, um, separate genes. All right, and then in four, so figure four, this one is now looking at ALDH18A1. And that is another gene that they found to be affected or to affect HCC cell lines and proliferation. So similar to figure two, they were setting out to prove how this regulated cell proliferation. Just a quick recap though of what ALDH is. I'm just gonna call it that just so I don't have to call it the whole name the whole time. So ALDH initiates the um, conversion from glutamate to proline. So for FLHCC group members who have seen our proline pathway picture, this is where we would see P5CS on the pathway. Okay, and then, then similar to PYCR1, this was barely detectable in normal or non-tumor liver tissues, but highly expressed in tumors. So A is a Western blot showing the similarity in um, three different animal models. So on the right, you see our tumor samples right there and it's highly expressed within the tumor. And then we're not seeing a lot of banding on the left showing that it's not very high, it's not highly expressed in non-tumor samples and throughout those animal models. B shows ALDH and HCC cell lines. So we have HEP3B and HA7. The ALDH level is measured and shown to be lower in the knockdown models than in the control. So then the Western blot there is then again to serve as kind of a visual representation of where they got those numbers. And like we said before, that gap DH is a uh, control for us kind of. Going into C, this shows now the level of cell proliferation seen in ALDH knockdown cells. And we do see that there is a lower cell proliferation after knockdown. So that white bar, is higher than most of the colors with the exception of Ha7, number two, it looks like they are about the same. D also shows the level of cell proliferation in HCC cell lines. And they were then again showing that the reintroduction through a vector would rescue cell proliferation. And that is why the navy bar on the very far right for both graphs is higher than the two middle blue bars. So we're seeing higher expression of it once it's been reintroduced through that vector. Over, and then overall, again, the data suggests that the conversion from glutamate to proline, what ALDH um, converts and mediates, is crucial for cell proliferation. So the big question now is how does all of that information Ailey just talked to, that PYCR1, that ALDH1, 8A1, and ProDH, how does that all relate to metabolism? Um, like we decided it's there, it's upregulated, there's proline. Um, so how do these tumors actually use this to proliferate? So if we were in person, we would probably be asking you guys to brainstorm at your table, watch you all look a little bit confused. There'd be a little awkward silence for a second before Dr. Yang probably tried to answer it, but then she would stop herself. Um, so if you really wanna pause the video, you can to think about it. But the answer is NAD plus, which is a cofactor. So I made it, oh, I didn't, 
that one, whatever, we'll come back. So first thing about metabolism is cells need it. All cells need it specifically tumors because they are trying to go through the cell cycle super fast. They're trying to pro proliferate as quickly as possible. And in order to proliferate, you need ATP. Um, the lightning bolt makes me think of like mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. That's why I put it there. We need lots of ATP to support going through the cell cycle quickly because it is expensive. But how do we make ATP? A little bio 120 throwback. Glucose. Um, glucose is broken down through glycolysis and then we get the ATP from the ETC. That is like the preferred pathway for cells. So normally when oxygen is present, we go through glycolysis, pyruvate oxidation, the Krebs cycle, throw back on all of those, and then into the ETC where we're producing, it's like 32 ATP. This is called aerobic respiration. But tumors can get so thick, as you can see, they're wrapped tightly around that blood vessel that they start to not have enough oxygen or their cells are being blocked from the blood vessel. So cells kick into fermentation mode, producing lactic acid in order to regenerate these cofactors, this NAD plus, um, because you need the NAD plus to accept an electron so you can keep going through glycolysis. So this is where proline starts to come in because we are short on NAD plus. We need more cofactors if we wanna keep going through glycolysis to get more ATP to proliferate. So that's, um, a visual model of what like the protein that PYCR1, the gene product is. Um, PYCR1 specifically turns P5C into proline and NAD plus or NADP plus, which then is just NADPH instead of NADH. So this is our link, NAD plus. So how does that actually work? And how did the researchers prove this? in this nifty little chart. So this is where Ailey talked about glycolytic function test. Probably butchered that. So they looked into metabolite screening. So we've heard about proteomic screens or like a genetic screen is a really hot word right now. Well, a metabolic screen looks at everything that the cell is actually trying to do. So they found specifically that glucose metabolism pathway was most affected by PYCR1. So first, they looked at the pathway. Let me get my little laser pointer back. This is our normal function. This is our control. Everything is up. The time makes sense. We start to get more glycolysis going on through time and then it kind of drops down. So it's got enough ATP. But then they knock down PYCR1 through waves, which Ailey talked about. And as you can see across the board, that there is a significant difference in glycolysis functioning. It is lower, things aren't happening, but also it shows that just the capacity for glycolysis is decreased. Not only is it actually happening less, but the cell can't do it anymore. They've reached kind of this finite point. Um, this is in our uh, HUS cells, by the way, this is our cell cancer line, so capacity is totally lowered. And then, in E, you see that the metabolite level, so this includes more than just glycolysis at this point, is decreased based on these cofactors. So our normal control, pretty high, the cells are proliferating, everything's going well. But then in our knockdown, we're seeing that there's not that much NAD plus to go around, which is that's what's kind of stunting our glycolysis. So overall, this suggests that proline biosynthetic enzymes influence the glycolic and then another pathway that they really talked about a lot was the pentose phosphate pathway, potentially through the genera generation of NADPH and NAD+. So that's the big takeaway, is this cofactor is what's starting to relate them all. Um, so now we're going to look at this in human samples. So this is the point where they're feeling really good about what they found in vivo and in vitro models. So all the rat tumors, the um, cell lines they've looked at, they're ready to analyze this in actual HCC patient samples. These samples were from a Singapore general hospital and the TCGA LIHC cohort, which is, I believe, a study that they were doing. So this part of the graph over here 
is looking at the three genes that Ailey has and I have talked about, the PYCR1, the ALDH, and PRODH. So these gene expressions follow the same patterns as their other models. We're seeing increased PYCR1 and LDH, ALDH, sorry, and a decreased PRODH. Um, this chart is one that I'm really excited to talk about because this is actually looking at this gene expression, but also tumor grade. So tumor grade means how intense and how quickly the tumor is going. I'll just recap the stages. So stage zero indicates that the cancer is where it started, hasn't spread. Stage one, the cancer is small, still hasn't spread. Stage two, the cancer has grown, but it has not spread yet out of its original site. Stage three, the cancer is larger and may have spread to the surrounding tissues or lymph nodes. Um, so kind of part of the lymphatic system a little bit. And then stage four, um, as many of us know, this cancer is spread from where it has started to at least one other body organ, meaning that there is a secondary cancer site and it's metastatic cancer. So some interesting findings specifically in D is that the higher the tumor grade, three and four specifically, the more intense this pattern that they're seeing is being. So that means that an HCC tumor grade four has a much greater uh, PYCR1 expression than like our control or our tumor grade one and two. This could be to, due to the fact that um, a four is more likely to be in that respiration stage without oxygen because it's proliferating so rapidly. Um, this trend is observed in each of the ones that tumor grade three and four are more intense of the effects. So then this final part, figure E, this is um, something that I had never seen in like some of the articles we've read, which I've really liked is this patient survival rate. So at the end of the day, all of the research that they're doing, all the research we're doing is to better the prognosis of these cancers. And they saw that patients who maintained high levels of ProDH, so that's remember opposite of our PYCR1, or low levels of expression of ALDH1AA or PYCR1 had significantly better survival rates. This means that these results add to the evidence that changes in the proline metabolic enzymes confer functional advantages in tumors, means it's better for the tumors, worse for the patient, and suggests that expression levels may serve an, an independent indicator of disease severity and clinical outcomes. So that means that um, they're looking specifically to kind of extend this x-axis, which is the goal. Okay, so as a final summary, uh, they were able to demonstrate that the proline biosynthetic pathway is altered and upregulated in animal tumor models, HCC cell lines, and human HCC samples. Changing the expression of those enzymes that we were talking about, or genes, sorry, excuse me, that we were talking about, so PYCR1, ALDH, and then the lower ProDH, um, did influence the proliferation of those cell lines in vitro and in vivo. So for example, the knockdown of PYCR1 changed the level of cell proliferation. So again, you know, bringing that back though, it is worth noting that the non-tumor liver tissues, normal proliferating cells and regenerating liver tissues did not express high levels of PYCR1 or ALDH. So it means that that is specific to cancer proliferation. It's not seen in any of those normal levels. Um, and I, I think we thought that was super cool. So therefore, with that known, the PYCR1 and ALDH can be potential therapeutic targets for HCC based on this research. Um, and they were able to tell that the lower expression, they, through this, they were able to tell the lower expression of PYCR1 and ALDH with the high, though, of expression of PR to P. ProDH, excuse me, leads to smaller HCC tumors. Relating back to that prognosis thing that Hannah was talking about that's super important is that by using these as therapeutic targets, one way that they could diagnose someone is through monitoring or figuring out the expression of those genes within 
those patients. So certain levels will then help diagnose whether or not they have HCC. Yeah. So then future experiments. So this is kind of our last little stop for our questions. Um, the first thing that like we kind of hinted at the whole time is that we want to utilize Western blot techniques on um, probe for PYCR1, ProDH, and LDH. 1A A1. Just because if we can do that, we can establish kind of this similar link between HTC and FLHTC, which would allow us to further test into these because we need to establish that we can make this comparison before we fully like test out this comparison. <laughs> and then specifically, sorry, <laughs> in our lines, we want to replicate some of the stuff that they did. So first thing would be we need to be able to transfect ourselves, which Check mark uh, Katrina um, has really perfected that technique, which has been awesome. So then we would need to start to grow these cells. So right now we just kind of grow them in a dish and then we collect them for the other part of FLHCC group to test. But we would have to grow them in some sort of antibiotic. And once we are sure that they have this chimera, we would want to also test the PYCR1, ALDH, and ProDH levels as well as proline levels. And then we could look into glycolysis levels and really work on perfecting the HEK293 as a cancerous FLHCC line because kind of like the article talked about or like we did is you test on all these other models first because they're readily available, much easier to access, easier to use, easier to recreate, but we would need to establish an effective FLHCC cell line to do that because there isn't one yet. The other thing that our group has been talking about, which is really cool, we were supposed to go to Mayo yesterday, but nope. We still really want to work with Mayo. You have sad days. Um, and look at tumor grades and kind of see if we can get a little bit more clinical information to see if we can do a slightly different analysis than we've been doing to look at if um, the more intense the tumor, different proline levels, that kind of stuff to look at that last chart. And then these are our questions. So I know you're all so, so <laughs> excited to do them. Um, you can just like pause the video, I guess, or I think we're done. Got anything else, Ailey? Um, I'm sorry for my dog's movement in the background. Um, otherwise though, good luck with the questions. I think you'll do great. Hopefully you enjoyed this. Yeah, so. That's all I got. <laughs> good job, guys. I hope you all are doing well. Enjoy the video.